said we were going to do tonight, I want to start a new series that I've entitled Deeper Dedication. I have several messages in it for a number of weeks, so we'll start going tonight in Philippians chapter 2. Deeper Dedication. I think that's what Christianity is all about. Romans 1, 1, going from faith to faith, Romans chapter 1, that is, and 2 Corinthians chapter 3, going from glory to glory. Any person who is satisfied with where they are doesn't deserve the title of a Christian, let alone of a charismatic. And yet how many people have I met in the past who, when you try to share something deeper with them from the Word of God, they'll say something like, well, but what do I need with that? I already have A, B, C, D, and they'll go down the line. Or they'll say, but I think God's satisfied with me where I am. Or abomination of abominations, but I am satisfied with right where I am. So I don't guess we're really talking to anyone like that because you'd have to preach a message on how to get saved to talk to someone like that. They don't deserve the worthy distinction of being called by the name of Christ. A Christian, if they are satisfied where they are. Now, being satisfied is not the same thing as being complacent because many times satisfaction is lifelong. It never changes. But there is a remedy for complacency and all of us have hit a plateau sooner or later somewhere. Hopefully it's only for a day or so where you're just kind of complacent, really not going deeper with the Lord like you know that you should be. There are things that you can do about that, and that's our subject tonight in Philippians chapter 2. You know, it's just a saying that whatever you encounter a new mathematical problem or a new difficulty in maybe a board game that you're playing or just trying to make some important decision about anything in life, then you'll hear the statement, well, it's time to return to square one. And generally what we mean by that is it's time to return to basics, start with basics, return to square one because there's really no way you'll ever get to the end of the game if you've been misled and you've gotten off the track until you go back to square one. You might have done square one before and two and three and four. And now you're not on any squares, you're over on rectangles. The only way you're going to really get back and really get back going is to go back to square one. That's just the way it is about anything. You generally have to start in square one. And so square one that I have for us this evening from Philippians 2 is the subject of working out our salvation. Philippians chapter 2 and the statement made by the Apostle Paul in the 12th verse. Square one, working out your salvation. <clears throat> That's something that we all need to realize because <clears throat> people will hit a difficulty in their life and then just sit down on God right there, not recognizing that part of their calling as an end-time charismatic Christian, is to not let your difficulties and problems overwhelm you. Maybe it's a spiritual dilemma that you're in, but it's there as part of your salvation to work it out. To work out your salvation means that there are things there that need to be worked out. Not that the salvation is not perfect and complete in itself, but it's got to be worked out in your life, in your heart, through your own experiences. Otherwise, it can just remain wrapped up in a nice little tight package, and it's a beautiful gift, but without opening it, it means nothing at all. Without opening it and working it out, it means nothing at all. So Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12, Paul says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only. This was a good group of people, dear friends. Generally, when you turn your back on people, they go to pot. Sometimes it's literal. But now, much more in my absence. That's commendable of people when you can say, not only in my presence, but much more. Generally, you've got to have a figurehead there. You know that's true. If the boss isn't at the place of employment, then nothing gets done. If the boss is not there, 
then you just kind of do what you want to. I remember what it was like. I worked at an RV center for a number of summers whenever I was still in high school, between different years in high school. And he always, with his family, took a week or two weeks off toward the end of the summer that I remember on one occasion came whenever I was still there. And he said he was going to be gone. And you see, not only did we know what was going to take place, but he knew about it. All bosses know that. So he made us work real hard the week before he left because he knew a lot was not going to be done while he was gone. And sure enough, once he left, as soon as he left, I think he left maybe a Friday was his last day, and then on a Monday, everyone came to work a little bit late. Now, I didn't, but I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about what most people are like. Everybody was to work a little bit late. Everybody walked a lot more slowly than whenever he was around. He wasn't up in that little building on the front of the lot looking out the window back there. You always knew he was up there at that window looking out. He wasn't there. Nobody was there. Even his wife was gone. She was vice president of the company there. Even she was gone. She was a lot more easy to deal with than he was. But he was a friend of our family, so I never had any problem. I should say I was part of the family of God, so I never had any problem. Oh. Well, yeah. both ways it worked out to my advantage, to get the job and keep the job and do well and get paid nothing for it. Praise the Lord for that. Oh, but <laughs> Slave labor is what I call it. But there were slaves in the New Testament. I mean, slaves didn't get paid anything. At least I got paid minimum wage in one time. Gloria, Gloria, I got a 10 cent raise, and that was my last year there. I think it was towards the end of my tenure there, so that didn't do a lot of good, but I wasn't there to make money. I was there because my dad said I had to be there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I shouldn't have said that. That gets me in trouble. You sound lazy. Well, I would rather have stayed home and studied, but the point is, you staying home and study, you probably won't get to work out your salvation. Like you can work your salvation out when you're out there in the world running into these various problems and difficulties. Well, the point is that Paul had a blessed group of people who obeyed not only in his presence, but he said much more. I think I said in a recent message, you ought to be your best when no one's around you. Right. Well, there's a verse for it right there. He said they've obeyed much more whenever I wasn't there to commend them. Someone must have reported in. And he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. It's like if your wife buys you one of these big, what we used to call gizmos. You don't know exactly what it is. A big gizmo. Your wife buys you that for your birthday or for your anniversary or just because she loves you that Saturday. She didn't on Friday, but she now does on Saturday. So she buys you this big gizmo, and you look at it, what in the world is that? You don't know anything about that. It does you no good till you kind of start playing around with it. Maybe it has to have batteries in it. It won't work without batteries. Maybe it needs to be oil. Maybe it needs to be wound up, cranked up, kicked, stomped, prayed over something to get the thing going. And so until you start working that, working with that, working it out, it's not going to do you any good at all. There it is. It's a nice whatever it is. You finally find out it's a shotgun loading machine. You didn't know what that was. You don't have a shotgun, but she thought it was a cute toy at the store, and so she bought it. We used to have one of those. I remember it's fun to play with. But to learn how to really operate that thing and get it to make your own shotgun shells for you, we made them out in the backyard like it was supposed to, well, that can be difficult to do until you work it out. Now, the point is, a lot of people have, you know, that's just like a huge gift. A lot of people have this gift of salvation. It's still in the box. The name tag is still on there. The beautiful heavenly paper still wraps it up still got string around it. There's even a bow still left on it. And people have done nothing at all with their salvation. You see, God worked salvation in us, and now he wants us to work it out. To make a cake, you have to work all the ingredients in it. You work in the ingredients. You put it in the stove, and the stove works them out. It makes it real big all of a sudden. It works it out. You work it in. God's worked salvation in us. He didn't say work your own salvation up or work it in you, you know, by good works you obtain salvation. That's what I mean by working it in, because some people have the confused concept of trying to do that. That would be working in your salvation. No, he didn't say work it in, but rather work it out. If you look over in Matthew chapter 25, I'll give you one of the parables of Jesus that could be used to 
mm. illustrate this point that I'm on. That salvation is a free gift, but just like anything else God gives us, if you leave it wrapped up in the package, you don't take the bow off, cut the string, undo the paper, open the box, get it out of all of the tissue paper, put the batteries in it, oil it, crank it up, start using it, you're not working it out then. You've got a piece of J-U-N-K that's worth nothing at all. It can just sit in the corner. It does nothing at all. Now, how many people are lo like that? They're content just to sit and rot in the pew. They're not doing anything with their salvation. The whole, there's a whole horde of people out there who actually equate church membership with discipleship. There's a multitude of people. I don't mean that they think that that might be true. They're totally convinced that church membership is the same as discipleship, that religiosity is the same as Christianity, that manology is the same as theology. They think that it's all the same. And they're content just to sit and rot on a pew like a fuzzy fossil. And if you try to preach to them a message of working out your salvation, they think, work? I don't know. I'm not going to do anything. It's all God. It's all God. Didn't the Bible say it's all of grace? Well, maybe it says that somewhere. But we just read Philippians 2.12. Amen. And I didn't read grace in that verse. I read you work your salvation out Amen. with fear and trembling. Now, I didn't say work it in. You've already got it. You see, people confuse a verse like that. Well, that sounds like a works religion. No, it's not. You've already got your salvation. You didn't do anything to get that gift from your wife. It's a free gift. But now she expects you to use that. You've got to start working that out. I mean, how many times do you get something that's maybe a really a nice gizmo that it really doesn't work very well until you work what we call the kinks out of it? Yeah. Take a new car, for example. Sometimes they're the worst to have until you've driven it two, 3,000 miles. You know what I'm talking about. New car's not good sometimes. You drive it two, three, four, five thousand 5,000 miles, pretty soon what happened? You worked all the kinks out of it now. Now it's a good automobile. Well, the comparison is true with salvation. You just got really an empty package. As far as you're concerned, it's empty. There might as well be nothing in it because you're not using what God has placed in it until you start working it out. Now, I know people don't like to hear that because it implies they have to do something. It more than implies it, it commands that we work out our salvation. But if you look here in Matthew 25, you'll see how important it is to work and to use the things that God has given us. He gives a parable, the so-called parable of the talents, Matthew 25, beginning with verse 14. And notice how similar this is to the account that we've given, or let's reverse that. The illustration that I've given is similar to what Jesus said. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own slaves and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, and to another two, and another one, and so forth. Verse 16, then those that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them five other talents. Now, what did they do with those five talents? They worked them out. Those five talents aren't going to do you any good. I'm going to prove that by getting to the end of the parable here. People think, well, at least I've got my salvation. Do you really? He shows here if you don't use what you have and work it out, that may just prove you don't have it in the long run. I don't mean that you ever had it and lost it. I mean it wasn't truly yours to begin with. Because look what this individual did. The one who had five talents, he went and worked his talents out. He was wise. He didn't say, I'm just going to sit and be comfortable and be satisfied on my lees with my five talents with which I've been blessed. But rather, he goes out, he trades with them. That's a shrewd individual, wise individual and he made five other he doubled doubled what he had likewise he that had received two he also gained other two he almost caught up to mr five before he gained other five <coughs> and then old fuzzy fossil church member of verse 18 he that received one that's about all you've got in the system is one <laughs> 
or maybe a fraction of one, he went and digged it in the, digged the earth and stuck it down in the hole in the ground. He thought he was really bright. I don't want anything to happen to my one little tiny ruby that I have. So he's so proud of his one ruby, and we can add, and he's so lazy and complacent and so satisfied, he doesn't do anything about it. He doesn't even want any more besides the one little thing that he's got. And so he goes and he digs a hole in the ground. He sticks his Lord's money there. And a long time later, the Lord comes back and he reckons with them. So he that had received five talents came and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. This Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful slave. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Now, I know the end of that verse is quoted over the coffins of many missionaries. But I don't know that it applies to them. And you gave up home and family back here in the States and went over to make two voodoo disciples. And I wonder about the Lord's calling. <coughs> And he also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, you gave me two, and I give you four in return. Wouldn't you want someone to do that with your money? Well, certainly. You don't want them to come back and give you stale money that's now not worth what it was when you gave it to them. That's the point that he's using here. His Lord said unto him, Well, you've done good also. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. And then old fuzzy fossil church member came with his one talent, said, Lord, I knew you were a hard man. You were a hard preacher. And I knew you just gathered where you hadn't even sown. You stole things that belonged to other people. <laughs> he was really afraid of his master here. He said, I was afraid. Well, that's what he says in verse 25. I was afraid. And I went and hid thy talent in the earth, and lo, there thou hast that is thine. He thought that was good. I, I'm giving you back what you gave to me. <clears throat> His Lord answered and said, You're a wicked and a slothful slave. You knew that I reap where I sowed not and gathered where I have not straw. He said, You ought to have at least lent the money out so that I could have interest on it. Verse 28, Take therefore the talent from him and give it unto him that doubled his five. You wonder why some of us are just grabbing for all of it? Because look here, what the top ones get. They get more. Jesus said, To him that hath shall more be given. And he shall have abundance. And from him that hath not shall be taken away. I um, was quoting, now I'm reading verse 29. Even that which he, as another gospel writer gives it, which he appeared to have, which he seemed to have, which he thought he had. In other words, he really didn't have it. It really wasn't his. It really wasn't a part of him because he had never worked it out and used it. Look at verse 30. Cast that unprofitable, fuzzy, fossil church member into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You start really dusting the jackets of the Amen Corner Brethren, and you'll get double grunts out of those fuzzy fossils. And I've had it in churches before. I'm talking about Baptist churches with denominational people there. You start dusting the jackets of those Amen Corner Brethren. They'll amen you on everything until you start preaching down their alley. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, instead of hallelujah, it's all oh my, oh me. You're talking to them. They were content sitting there with the badge of church membership, not doing anything at all. Now, we here in this church aren't above or beyond that until you make yourself above and beyond that. <coughs> no one can do it for you. We're going to get back to that point later on over in our passage in Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12 of whether or not you're sitting there with a badge of membership personal identification at least location next to someone else in a church like this and so maybe you're not doing the word of god 
Really, you could tie something like Philippians 2 into James 1. Not hearers of the word only, but doers of the word. Doers of the work, as a matter of fact, is the word that's used over there in James. He didn't come back and say, be a doer of the word. He says, be a doer of the work, W-O-R-K. There's work to do, to work out your salvation, to make your calling and your election sure, to prove your Christianity to yourself, to God, to the devil, and to all of these witnesses that are watching what we're doing. There's a, there's a major calling just in the calling to work out your salvation. That's why we start with it as square one. People are just camped out on pews or on a log for a stump. They're not working their salvation out in all areas of their life. Whenever you hear the word of God in a certain area, you've got to start working that area out in your life. Amen. Now, by the way, Notice from just the language that's used here in Philippians 2, it doesn't happen overnight. He says you have to work it out, which means it's a process. Whenever you hear the word of God about any matter, you've got to start working that out in your life. If you've heard some lately about how those are blessed when they mourn, if you've got that old spirit of a hard, cold heart, then you've got to work that out of your life then. A lot of people get real upset and kind of fearful whenever they come to some major spiritual problems in their life. There's nothing to be afraid of. You can never work anything out if you didn't run up against some of these dilemmas that some of you have been running up against recently. There'd be nothing to work out then. There'd be nothing to overcome. There'd be nothing to get the victory through. And it all boils down to the working out of your salvation. You couldn't really work out your salvation, perfect it, and develop it until you run into some of these obstacles and blockades, whether it's healing, prosperity, deeper life in the spirit, in your mind, in your heart, in your prayer life, your fasting life, your studying life, your witnessing life. Don't be afraid just because something is pointed out from the word of God that you're not doing. It's just pointed out of the Holy Spirit to you so that you can start working that area out in your salvation. Our salvation, we're told, for instance, in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, is no small thing. It's spoken of there by the writer of Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, as so great a salvation. So great a salvation. Which means that it just really includes everything. The Bible doesn't use the word salvation in the restricted sense of denominationalism that if you believe on Jesus, your intangible soul will get saved. People talk about, we saw 44 souls get saved. Well, what's a soul look like? The Bible, in using the word salvation, includes everything in the Christian walk. We've taught you before from passages like Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19, that being filled, baptized with the Holy Spirit is just part of salvation. That's not supposed to be something that happens 50 years <coughs> later. That is a part of it all. You believe on Jesus, you're filled with the Spirit, He heals your body, you're delivered from demons, He prospers you. He just does it all. That's all part of our salvation. Hallelujah. So He doesn't mean work out something yeah. down in your soul, work out anything that you're having some problem with in your Christianity in your salvation, that's square one. You can't start looking for something beyond that until you can take what you've got right now. How many of you know I've got a problem right tonight? You need to work on that. That's all God asks of you. You can't go and start praying about it and say, God, have mercy, and let me see it another day or something. When you know that there is a problem there, or maybe not a problem, but there's just an area where you want to go further, we can put it that way, and deeper, then there's something to start working out. <clears throat> He's writing to people who are already saved and filled with the Spirit and have a lot going on in their life, but he said, I'm glad that you've never put a period to the working out of your salvation. Now, we're told over in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, that salvation is not of works, but in the same passage we are told that salvation is unto works. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. We're not saved of works because then it'd be of works and not of grace and we could boast. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Salvation is not of works. But salvation is unto works, Ephesians 2, 10. 
And not only that, if you read the 10th verse, or maybe you have it memorized, you know that he's talking about works that have been appointed to us and we to them before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 2.10. What do people say whenever it's time to get on the exercise train and lose maybe four or five pounds or maybe 14 or 15 pounds, they say it's time to work out. It's time to work out. And what happens when you work out if you've ever worked out before? They're talking about, I'm going to go down to the gym tonight to work out. Work out doesn't mean you're going to go down there and listen to classical music. <laughs> you're going to go down there and start sweating and pumping iron and riding the exercise bike and jumping the rope until the pounds just start to fall. Well, you wish they'd fall literally and hit the floor. <laughs> but you still are working it out. Working it out of you, out of my body, off of me. Go away. Don't come again another day. Amen. You're working it out. Well, Amen. that's just the term people use, working out. I'm going to go work out tonight. I worked out yesterday. I worked out four hours this week. Well, transfer that to the spiritual area, and that's what it is. It is a struggle, and it is a work, but you'll never know what you've got. You'll, you never know what that gizmo is, what it'll do until you start using it. You never know that. And of course, the point is from Matthew chapter 25 is that if you refuse to ever use it, it may prove that it was never yours to begin with. It was laid before you just like the word has been laid before many people. But the people haven't responded, the people haven't taken the word and used it. In 1 John chapter 3, John the Apostle speaks of God's seed being placed in us which is the seed of the word that produces salvation. James 1, we've been begotten by the word of truth. 1 Peter 1, that word of truth has produced our salvation in us. It's the word of God. God has given us this germ or this seed, our salvation. But he now expects us through the Spirit's power to bring it to maturity in our life. It's just the whole message of Christianity. And because we've been brought up in a religious environment that doesn't emphasize things like this, as a matter of fact, they emphasize just the contrary to this, that once God's done it, it's been done forever. There's nothing else you can do about it. It's settled. doesn't matter what you do. Don't blaspheme the Holy Ghost. But it doesn't matter what you do. Besides that, you'll make it into heaven one day. And you know what? There's no chapter and verse for that in the Bible. As a matter of fact, Philippians 2.12 contradicts that when Paul says, work out your salvation. Dear friends, why do you think you find it hard sometimes to fast, hard to pray, hard to study, hard to witness? It's not going to be easy every time you put your hand to the plow. Plowing is hard. You've got to work at it to get it to go. Once you get the old donkey, the old mule moving and the old plow moving, it's pretty easy then, but you've got to get going, though. You know how much it takes to get one of those locomotives going with that huge train of cars behind That's difficult to get going. But once that thing gets going, it's difficult to stop then. It takes a mile, two miles for some of these big trains to stop. You just can't stop. You're going. But to get going, it's a huffing and a puffing and a huffing and a puffing, working out whatever fuel it is you're using, working it out till it gets into the system of the engine until it's built up the right speed and it just starts sailing along. And, of course, there comes a time where it has to stop and do that all over again. Well, for us, it's in all areas of our life. We find new areas where things have to be worked out diligently. That's why you're running into problems. Don't run from the problems. They're there to be worked out. Once you work them out, they're worked out. I'm not saying they'll never happen again, but if you keep your defenses up, they probably won't. I mean, there'll be other things God deals with you about, and there'll be deeper areas in that one dimension. But once you've worked it out, you've worked it out. People are afraid, and therefore they run of and from their problems. And a difficulty. It's difficult. And people really do. Some of you really have forgotten this passage to work out your salvation. That's why it's difficult. You're starting to work it out. 
And it's not going to be settled until you're working out. It's not going to be settled. The same is true with any of these other illustrations that we've given you. Until you work it out, it's not going to be settled. Now, it's interesting the way Paul phrases all of this and puts it all together. Let me call your attention, for instance, to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. Philippians 1 and verse 6. God. Where Paul says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. So he says that in verse 6, and people just rest in that. God's begun a good work in me, and he'll perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. But look what happens when you flip over to chapter 2 and verse 12. Now he says you perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ by working out your own salvation. So that, well, that sounds confusing. Well, then take verse 13, and he puts both of those previous passages together. For it's God which worketh in you both to will and to do. But you still got to do it and will it, though. But it's God working in you to will and to do. He's putting 1, 6 and 2, 12 together. For it's God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. He began the work by calling you. You didn't call him. You love him because he first loved you. Amen. He started the work. Now that he started the work, he's given you the will and the power to finish it, and that's what he expects you to in chapter 2 and verse 12, to finish it unto the day of Jesus Christ. For the continuation of this message,